So let, let me ask you a simple question. How many of you have used LibreOffice? The chances are that if you're a Linux user, that's the only Office suite that you would be using. There are so many other Office suite that you can use on Linux, but this is the most popular one. And even if you're on Mac OS or Windows, there is a possibility that you have used LibreOffice in some capacity, you have heard about it, or you're already using it right now, just the way I am using it. I use all three platforms, Mac OS, Linux, and Windows, and I use LibreOffice on all th three platforms. Uh, as you know, LibreOffice has been in development for a very long time. Uh, I have been actually covering LibreOffice since day one, uh, when it was uh, announced. Actually, if you go to the Document Foundation wiki page, you will find that I am one of the first journalists who talked to them. So I have been writing about it since the very beginning. And uh, it's really amazing how much work they have done in all these years because they inherited a lot of code from open office and you know, they kind of modernize all that code and everything. So there's a lot of work. And a few days ago, a new version of LibreOffice came out. It's LibreOffice 6.0. And I wrote about it for the Linux Pro Magazine. It's an amazing release. I've been using it on my system and uh, it's kind of, you know, you can really the, from the UI perspective, uh, it has a ribbon interface. I don't know how many of you like it. I love it because as a writer, I need quick access to all the tools so I can very easily choose the tool that I want. And I have like this 4K 32 inch monitor. So I don't really care about the space that much. I have ample space there. So I love, love it. Uh, so, um, and then there is something called Colabra Productivity. I don't know how many of you have heard of it, but it's a, it's a UK-based company that creates or sells LibreOffice-based products. And that, that's what a you know, very common practice in the open source world, you know, where you have a fully open source project and then you have a commercial offering around that project. So Colabra Productivity offers, I think, two products. One is an online suite, which is called Colabra Online, and then they offer a desktop suite, which is based on LibreOffice. So both these versions are based on LibreOffice. So what they do is that uh, they kind of customize a bit for the enterprise customers and they offer full support and SLAs around these products. So once you get uh, LibreOffice through them as their branded product, you get all the support that you would expect, you know, around a enterprise grade solution. And a lot of companies and a lot of organizations in Europe, they use it. So I talked to Michael Meeks, he's general manager of Collaborative Productivity. He has been involved with LibreOffice uh, since very early days, I, I, days before that, he has worked with Suzy and all those companies. And then he has been working on this office suite since you know very early on. And he, and he has been an open source developer. I, I, I love talking to Michael. He's an amazing guy. You know, I met him, I think, twice in at FOSDEM. And uh, I have known him ever since. And whenever a new release of open office and whenever a new release of LibreOffice or Collabra comes out, I always talk to him. So in this interview, uh, we are going to talk about LibreOffice, what's new there. We'll talk about Collabra online and Collabra suite, what's new there. Uh, what are the kind of new things that you can expect from the productivity suite? What kind of market is there? And a lot of other things. So uh, without you know further ado, let's talk to Michael. Michael, before we start this interview, I mean, I have known you for so long, but just for the sake of our audiences, can you quickly introduce yourself that? What are you doing there? I'm Michael Meeks. I'm a, a Christian hacker, a Christian husband hacker, something like that. You know, you've got to get these three words uh, in the right order. And uh, yeah, so I spend my time working on uh, LibreOffice uh, primarily. I'm also the uh, general manager of Calabra Productivity, which is a subsidiary of Calabra that does, well, I guess, LibreOffice development and tries to drive that. Uh, before that, I was at Novell and Sousa and Zimian before that, doing awesome stuff uh, in the free software desktop. So Gnome, Evolution, and of course, uh, OpenOffice back in those days too. So lots of stuff around Office documents and so on. Right. Since you mentioned, uh, this is totally Office script, you know. Shoot, Since you mentioned three things, and I do know, you know, you're a Christian hacker and a husband, right? I don't yes. know the exact order. But how are, <laughs> the, how are these three related? Because I can very easily understand, you know, religion and uh, spiritualism. When you mix that with open source, actually, that's you know, community serving help others, helping others. So, so is there any connection? Also? And husband, of course, you know, taking care of family and open source can be your big family. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I think it's important to get your priorities in life in a sensible order, isn't it? And so, you know, I think, yeah. So I think you know, I became a Christian in my gap year, uh, I suppose. And and it was fun because I used to program sort of with stolen compilers. You know, I, I'd write assembler games. And uh, well, 
uh, yeah, everything was kind of pinched on my machine from the operating system upwards. Uh, and it's funny, isn't it, how, how, I don't know, God put his finger on this one thing in my life that was probably irrelevant to anyone else I met. Like, I don't think anyone else I knew was even concerned about copyright, you know, and uh, any of these things at all. Um, but this was the thing, and it was a real struggle. It's like, uh, you know, why? But eventually I switched to this Linux thing. It was, it was just terrible at the time. It was, I don't know, 90, 95, 96. And it destroyed my hardware. I mean, it was, it was that bad, you know, like it, my first hard disk died in some death throes of Linux misdrive or whatever. So, and there was no games on it. You couldn't write UI. But, you know, anyway, I, I persisted over, over time. And, uh, yeah, so I met a whole load of cool people on whose coattails I have, uh, you know, managed to, uh, to to ride, which is uh, absolutely brilliant and so my, you know, very good for, for my career. But uh, yeah, and then of course my wife is very, very important to me. You know, she's the, the, the power behind the, the scenes, the uh, thing that makes possible to do this. And uh, yeah, and then I like uh, hacking, I guess. Uh, Okay. That's how the whole, okay, cool. Yeah, I uh, when I finished my journalism, I joined the Linux for Youth magazine, and I have been like covering uh, uh, Linux and open source since my first day of journalism. So I have been doing it over you know years, and and uh, you know as you rightly said, I I used to call it beer mode when yeah. I would drink beer at night, and I will you know all the time I'll end up formatting my hard drive, and and my uh, my friend and will next day will try to restore it. <laughs> <laughs> because yes. like the, the thing with Linux is, you know, you are always playing, you're always experimenting, you're always learning new things. So, of course, you know, and you're playing at the hardware, oh, sorry, file system level. So things do get screwed up. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, I think this is quite one of those quite interesting things where it actually it wasn't even the disk. It's not the disk layout that was screwed up. The actual hardware was burnt mm -hmm. out by the kernel. You know, right. like so, so, uh, yeah, so the disk yeah. no longer mm -hmm. functioned, which is... Which is yeah. pretty bad when you are kind of a young student, but but anyway, we, we got yeah. past that. In the end. Yeah, and now you know when I I continue to cover Linux, but my whole you know coverage has also evolved. And now whenever I go to any enterprise event, it's everywhere is Linux. So my job has become very hard to keep up with all these technologies. And if you look at your side of the aisle, you know, which is you know uh, you're building a, a commercial uh, solutions based on LibreOffice. Yeah. So so let's let's just start with the the LibreOffice six was released li recently, sure. and uh, and then you know you have announced uh, Collabora Office Suite. It's uh, Collabora Online. That's what it's called, right? What is the name of the yes, product? Yes, yes, absolutely. Col Collabora right. Online. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, how much? What, uh, so what's the new in this release? Can you talk about that? Sure, sure, sure. So I mean, there's just a whole load of things there. I mean, I think what you say about Linux going everywhere is, is just so true. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the slightly sad things, I think Karen Sandler was saying this in, in one of her OSCOM keynotes, is that if you look back in the day, in order to use Linux, you had to be some kind of self, uh, semi-masochistic, self-sacrificial person. You know, you were passionate about it because of the software freedom and that it was important. And these days, you know, I think there's a very low tolerance for things not working. Uh, you know, and, and oh, well, I, I have to use a Mac because insert very minor problem that, that you know, most of us would have uh, suffered with and helped fix uh, back in the day. It's, it's a, bit of a, a bit of a shame. But uh, yeah, so I think there's sort of a shallowness now in open source often uh, a lot was missing. So yeah, 6.0. Um, LibreOffice 6.0, well, it has lots of cool new stuff in it. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, <sighs> Where do I start? I think one of the problems with uh, LibreOffice is that it's so large um, that you know you can't revolutionize one part of it uh, in you know in a single release cycle. But there's some pretty cool things like uh, so I don't know the Open PGP integration is pretty nice. There's a document rotation there, both from at uh, There's a whole load of Open XML improvements. So starting to have a smart art uh, implementation uh, for, for some of the uh, pieces there, and hopefully that will. Uh, evolve EPUB uh, export is is really useful for a whole lot of people that, that like uh, you know the, the benefits of those open standards. Uh, Quark Express. I mean, just yeah. another thing that's nice, I guess, is the EMF plus uh, filter. So so when you have lots of embedded objects in Word documents, instead of showing you the object, they show you a preview of it because often it can be slow to load the object and render it. So much better show you a preview. But the preview is essentially a Windows API dump. Um, of how that would be drawn on Windows, which is called EMF or EMF plus. Um, so the original EMF is just a jump, dump of the GDI calls, I guess, system calls, uh, which comes, I mean, uh, GDI is really ancient, like Windows 16 had this, you know, like Windows 1.0, uh, you know, <clears throat> I guess start, started with this, uh, this GDI uh, rendering API, and then GDI plus is the more, more recent one. Either way, e EMF plus is, uh, 
just a lot better now. So lots of corner cases fixed, much better previews and renderings and so on. But it's quite funny, you have to bring all of that Windows rendering stuff effectively into your platform to be able to show these Microsoft documents. Obviously not ideal from an open standards perspective uh, by, by any means, but, but getting a lot better there. Right. So these are the features you're talking about, LibreOffice 6.0, right? This is 6.0 and yeah, yeah. LibreOffice 6.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, 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 but I'm also you know, curious about what's new in the Culebra. Uh, oh, right. What? Is it 3.1 or 3.0? 3.0, 3.0, yeah, yeah, abs yeah. absolutely. So uh, Culebra 3.0, so Culebra Online is, is bringing LibreOffice to your browser, I, I suppose. And uh, well, more specifically, Calabra Office. And the key things in 3.0 is, is trying to break this paradox. So at the moment, you can have an online office suite, but if you use it, it's terribly feature poor. So, uh, and if you start to look at, for example, uh, office.com or, or play with Office 365, you know, there are a whole load of things you can't do that are really frustrating. And so uh, a lot of these things look like an extended advert for the offline PC version anyway. Like, you can't do this, try it in the PC version. You can't do this. Right in the piece version. Um, simple stuff like just editing a chart, you know, like if you if you want to edit a chart and position legends and things, this is just not, not possible in, in Microsoft Office uh, online products. See, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring all of the richness of LibreOffice into your browser. So you don't have to choose, do I want you know online collaboration, browser deployment, or do I want features? You can actually have all of them. So uh, yeah, that's I guess where we're going. And so 3.0 brings a whole load of dialogues there um, around rich paragraph formatting, rich a rich functionality, uh, you know, in, in a whole load of areas, you know, rich cell formatting, uh, and bringing functions that are just not there um, in the browser elsewhere. If yeah. that makes sense. No, that makes perfect <laughs> sense. Uh, so it's a start. It, we we will continue doing this. Uh, so right. Well, you know, we're, we're yeah in increasing the amount of service. Yeah, because I was comparing uh, the because there is a demo available that you know I was comparing that with the with Google Docs and Office 365. And sure. uh, of course, you know, it's like kind of, you cannot even tell the emotions and sentiments that, you know, you are literally running LibreOffice on, <laughs> on you know, in, 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 a in a cloud based environment because it frees, you know, you from, from being attached to a platform. Uh, you can move easily. Uh, but there was like, as you mentioned, you know, it's like still, you know, there was some lag and there are, uh, so, so, uh, let's just keep it simple. So when you talk about all these new features and functionalities that you know are either coming in LibreOffice because you're also, you know, I mean, you have been you know, involved with LibreOffice and you still are, uh, versus, uh, you know, um, Colabra. So how much of these features are actually coming from what users need? Because you are, uh, compared to LibreOffice community, you actually have paying users, you know? You sure, are not sure. just throwing out features. What you think <laughs> you are you are actually responding to what your customers want. So what kind of what kind of uh, uh, demand or what kind of feature request is there? Uh, major features that your customers need. We have a case study on Ulster Hospital, which is a, a large hospital in the UK, and they're they're moving to uh, Calabra Office, I guess, mm -hmm. Gov Office on their PCs. There's about eight and a half thousand users there, and they're they're saving they're they're, they're going to avoid costs of around a million million pounds or so. Uh, you, you can go and read up my slides from the uh, LibreOffice conference, and they have a lot of lot of interesting problems. So, a lot of them interoperability corner cases. You know, their automated system generates Open XML in a pre-standardization dialect, and hey, we didn't support this, right? So, uh, you know, go go support that. So so you do or. Uh, we produce uh, timesheets and the timesheets, you just have to delete any blank rows because if you don't, when they go into an automated system to get paid, you don't get paid. And, you know, so we have to add permissions that allow people to delete rows, but not, you know, sort of make the permissions more, more granular. Um, so, so, so stuff like that. Another one that's amusing is mail merge. And this is a feature in LibreOffice 6. So, you know, I think it's already a bad idea to mail merge from uh, anything that's in a database, right? You should, you should store that. Uh, and so spreadsheets, but some people use spreadsheets for storing their address books. It turns out other people use writer documents, like a table, you know, in a word processing document to store their address list. Well, now we can mail merge from those as well, you know. So, so again, just user, user input wanting those features, terminal server optimizations uh, for, for large businesses that, that have particular use cases. So yeah, we, we fix stuff, obviously for our customers, we, we love to delight them, that's what we're here for. And uh, yeah, so lots of our work is, is customer driven just vast amounts of it. Right, and you mentioned this hospital, so are they using the online version or are they using your other collaborators? They're currently using the PC version, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, um, yeah. But then we have, we have other hospitals, actually right. two hospitals on the continent that aren't approved, you know, they haven't allowed us to, uh, you know, uh, yes. say who they are, that they're actually using, um, using a collaborator online. And, right. uh, yeah.
Seems yeah, because uh, as you see, there is a trend going on more and more, you know, people are moving towards the cloud because now you can have your own private cloud with OpenStack. So you are, even Definitely. if you're using cloud, that does not mean you have to give up your control. You can have your own cloud in the in your own data center. Of course, uh, of course. And that's a huge benefit of Collabor Online, you know, continuing to control your server, your data, your network. Right. I mean, all, all of these things are really quite important to make sure it's not going out of the building. And so for those people who have a, a real compliance need, I mean, you know, it used to be if you went in a bank and you plugged a device into the network that wasn't known, you know, right. alarm bells would ring, feet would run, you know, uh, all this sort of thing. And now it seems to be uh, increasingly the case that people don't, don't even care where the, where the data is or you know, right. how, how they control it. And, and who shares yeah, the machine? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we've exactly. seen with the meltdown spectre things that oh, exactly, it's, yeah. it's not just where the data is, it's just who else is running on that same piece of hardware mm -hmm. because they can be exfiltrating your data in all sorts of weird ways. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think just being able to control that and bring that in-house gives you a great degree of confidence. Great. And, uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, the adoption of OpenStack is growing a lot in Europe uh, and Europe is also one of those, you know, uh, places where you can, you know, think about privacy and all those things are very, very... Uh, uh, so, so with this adoption of you know this public uh, private cloud, do you also see a uh, growing kind of interest in Collabra Online there? Uh, do you see any kind of change in the market? <laughs> so we see lots of people who are very interested in uh, Collabra Online. So we, we try and partner with people. Uh, you know, our, our preferred approach to the market is to to go to market with, with partners, and we have a number of those. Uh, we see a lot, lots of interest in in you know <clears throat> you know the privacy benefits of being able to control your data. Uh, partnerships recently with with Dell, I think, and a number of other you know um, uh, key, key people. Look on look on our site. I mean, of course, Nextcloud, OwnCloud, uh, PyDO, Cfile will be four of the open source people we partner with, and we you know we love to serve those customers and integrate with them. I think there's this whole lot of sort of OEM uh, integrations too, where people want a Microsoft Office embedded, and they've got some legacy PC version written in VB or something, and then they think about well, we need to move to the cloud to provide this. You know, much more widely and expand our scope and reduce all those installation problems and so on. Um, but then how are we going to deal with this office piece? And so we see some customers who are like, oh, well, what we want is someone to show us a spreadsheet, select a range, integrate that with our database system and so on. And so that's, that's there's some whole lot of nice use cases there too uh, around sort of office as a service, you know, in, in this, uh, this embedded uh, box that we provide there. So from Colebra, you know, as a company's perspective, which is a which is a like lion's share, like the desktop market or the cloud based? Because you offer both. Sure, we offer both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think lots of people are interested in the PC piece, um, and so, so by by revenue or by interest, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so I think we have to live in the real world, don't we? This, right, this exactly. That's what more... I'm trying to understand. You know. Where, yeah, so absolutely. That my, yeah. I think there's probably a lot more people. Uh, interested in the uh, the PC, in the online version, obviously is a strategic direction to go in. I think that the cloud is very attractive to lots and lots of people. I think from a, a bread and butter business, you know, we've been in business now maybe five, five years doing new office, I think the PC version is still, okay. uh, is still launching. Although there's an interesting, a third, third part of that market where people are using a server use of LibreOffice already. So they're, they're generating documents, they're doing all sorts of uh, automation with it. Okay. And that's, that's another a chunk of our business, right? Yeah, so when we talk about uh, desktop space, that, that's why I wanted to understand so that I can, uh, next question could be based on that. The the thing is that, you know, you're literally looking at Microsoft's market. So uh, a lot of people, if they are using Colabra, they have to move their workloads to LibreOffice based solution. Uh, and it's not like, you know, you just format the hard drive, install it, done. You know, it's I think it's a, it's a, it's a process of migration and mindset and everything else. So do you also assist companies in that or they just buy your product and done? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Obviously, we want to help people migrate in a sustainable way so they get those cost benefits and they get the minimum of hassle and fuss. And to do that, we have partners. So we, we partner with a large number of people who are experienced at exactly this. And um, yeah, we, we try not to uh, get too involved in that process. We can train people to help uh, do that. Of course, the Document Foundation has a certified migration professional scheme as well that can help you know, give people confidence that they are actually choosing someone that's done this before, which is very, very helpful. I think our key uh, recommendation there is to, um, so, so when we talk to people, they realize that probably um, the alternatives are over-featured for what they want. They, they understand they need to segment their users and work out who the power users are and who the less power users are. Um, but I think probably the piece they miss is that you should install uh, Collabor Office, LibreOffice everywhere. So um, sometimes they go, oh, well, well, we'll just install, you know, Collabor Office in this section, but we'll leave Microsoft Office here. 
the problem then comes with which formats do you interoperate? And, and before you know it, you're crammed into this, well, Microsoft uh, you know, world, and you, you're stuck with this open XML format that is the silhouette of you know, uh, 35 years of engineering decisions taken over there. It's, it's a real problem. And it's no surprise that it has spikes and bumps around the edge of its uh, shadow, you know? Um, and so this causes grief. So what we really encourage people to do is install CollaborOffice everywhere, exchange ODF documents, and keep those problematic documents. You know, maybe there's some horrendous HR system that's an integration of Microsoft Office and some VB stuff, and sometimes a screen scraping of an HPX mainframe. Like, we, we see this in the real world. Keep that guy, but don't, don't send the files around. And often we find that the files, the huge accountancy files or, you know, spreadsheets, say, in Excel, are not ones that are mailed to everyone in the company. Which so they're sort of self self isolating into islands, uh, which is great. And so you know we see, for example, there's a bank in Italy, the third uh, one of the three biggest banks in Italy, and you know twenty thousand seats of uh, Calabra office for all of their branch offices, um, which is great. But then of course you know in, the, in their central office they're they're still in, in places using you know the the alternative. So uh, but but that works well with with again huge cost savings. I mean just right, uh, right. very impressive. Uh, and uh, the second piece of the same question is that. Uh, uh, so, so when somebody buys from uh, uh, subscribes or buys from Colabra, what kind of service do you they actually get? You know. So it depends to some degree what you buy. What we try and encourage people to buy is the product, and that then comes with a whole load of uh, product management integration. Uh, they can file as many bugs as they like, um, but we don't commit to fixing those immediately. If you want a, an SLA on those bug fixes, so engineers start working on your issue immediately, we provide that too. Uh, but so then. You know, the base product has, you know, security bug fixes, maintenance, and so on. Um, and we try and build a relationship with those customers. I mean, clearly, the, the bigger the customer, uh, the more we put into it. And unlike many other companies, you know, we have an open source mission at Calabra. You know, we want to uh, actually make open source rock. That's, that's basically the, the focus. So your money goes into improving, uh, you know, Calabra Office, LibreOffice by extension. Everything we do goes upstream. So, yeah. You know, it's 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 really it's really exciting to build that relationship with the customer and improve LibreOffice in ways that help them, um, and you know, just get their get their feedback. What are the features and the blocking them? Where are the problems they see? Uh, you know, and how how we can you know build that into our plans. It's it's just exciting. The new version of LibreOffice is out. Do you also help them in upgrading? Uh, because uh, it's not because it, it's a lot of data is attached to. It's not of course, of course. <clears throat> so we try and make sure that the new versions, of course, are you know backwards compatible and work really well. Um, we tend to ship an enterprise supported version, which doesn't come out uh, can, uh, aligned with the LibreOffice schedule. So we we have an annual schedule for our supported version. So we're still on five three. We'll be moving to six zero sometime um, uh, early this year, perhaps. But uh, so, so we do a whole load of extra uh, work on top of that to try and you know try and make sure the customers get a very good um, experience, and yeah, so, so we do help with that. We also provide MSP patches. So if you're deployed a large Windows estate, it's very easy to manage and upgrade and you know configure those, uh, which which helps people. Right. And, and do you like okay like honestly, do you really think that LibreOffice or Colabra is really ready for the? I mean, you have a lot of customers who are using yeah. it. Do you think it's like really, really ready? And why should customers move to 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 it instead of using the same age old, uh, which is actually is becoming <laughs> subscription based? So it's also so. I mean, we see increasingly large numbers of people doing this. I think um, often the driver for the PC version is cost saving. I think the driver for the online version is much more around privacy and control and 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 service and support and and having a real relationship. But I think there's a commonality of having a relationship with someone that is interested in your business, values your custom will fix things for you and make, you know, make your life actually a, a pleasant one. Uh, I think it's a bit sad that people get this idea that it is what it is and you have to live with it, you know, because it's software, right? It's infinitely flexible and we can make it better and better. And, and so we do, you know, so it, it, it's great to see that, uh, you know, if this is your top help desk problem. And I, I like to remember Clippy, you know, the paperclip, which sort of hindered people from, from doing their work. For, for months and months and months, and, and removing this thing, turning it off, which was actually not possible in the first releases, it's just a single flag. It's a boolean. It's a compile time check. This should be the very first thing that you do, you know? Uh, and that's something, you know, so if, if there are problems you have, then we can work around them, fix them, reduce your costs, not just of the software, but also the support uh, and services. And one of the things we found is that a lot of people actually would really value a, an inflection point where they need to do some training. We're constantly seeing documents produced by experienced professionals that show they don't understand their office suite. 
and actually giving them an excuse to go to a training session and asking silly questions and being shown stuff that's actually common to all office suites uh, can really improve their productivity and their, their acceptance of the product. So yeah, I think it's ready. It, it, it's ready, go, go get it, capture that win that other people are capturing and, and, and get a great relationship. Yeah, I think, yeah, because that, uh, the how they create it, because, you know, it's, it's they can create so many ways, but that's also leads to a lot of incompatibility or, you know, issues in the future. So training is, uh, I mean, when you're upgrading or migrating or whatever you're doing, it, it how you create it, you can use the tab or space or you can do so many different things to... Absolutely. So, so I, I think um, there's, there's some things there. Just, but, but I think just having a good understanding of how to quickly use your office suite and to use styles and to format documents that look pretty and that you can change how they look and so on it is, a, is a really useful thing. And I think if you're, if you're generating documents in LibreOffice, they are more likely to be better documents that interoperate better in both directions. Uh, just because of the, the, the subset and the tools we provide just lean in that direction uh, quite, quite strongly. Right. Now, uh, one one more question while we are still talking about, you know, the desktop market is that, um, and this could be an uncomfortable question, but I've been covering industry for a long time. So it's uh, when is the year of the Linux desktop, so I know. Yeah, you know no, <laughs> no, 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 I, no yeah. it's not. Uh, yeah, so the thing is that uh, historically, when we look at open source, it has always been to create alternatives, you know, whether it was Red Hat or whatever it was, you know, th there was a big market and what open source does, well, it commoditizes everything, you know, and it so a lot of people get involved. And for a long time, it was just chasing other, you know, products or, you know, services, which are there's well, Linux with Unix or whatever. Uh, but now things are changing, like Kubernetes has come out. There was nothing which was like Kubernetes. Uh, and a lot of innovation nowadays are happening in the open source world. E even if companies do work like Google open source TensorFlow, you know, and a lot of things companies do work, they throw it in open source so that, you know, let's let's build it together. So from from LibreOffice's point of view, are you still chasing Microsoft's market? Or, you know, you are also looking at actually driving innovation when you look, you know, that, you know, this is where people may be heading, you know, and let's build something uh, uh, instead of chase. So can you talk about that? Yeah, so it's, it's a really good question. Um, I think in terms of innovation and, uh, you know, uh, being a fast follower versus a, a leader, you know, there, there are, there's clearly huge benefits for the second guy on the bike. You know, like the, the guy at the front is catching the wind and, uh, you know, the guy has an easier ride behind. I think it's easy to look at open source and it's easy to look at the office market and to think that everything goes one way. But actually, I mean, there are some just huge, huge innovations that, that changing changing the market that have gone completely the other way. So I think, you know, the open XML file format in a zip file, for example, you know, where you can actually start to interact with the document structure and generate things and integrate with other systems in a clean way. It's just a, you know, it's just a, it's, it's really revolutionary in terms of document creation and processing. And that's clearly come um, from, you know, open document format and the, you know, the open source projects that back that. Um, you see other things, you know, like remote controls for, slide presentations, you know, standing in front of people and, and using your phone to see what's going on and using this laser pointer and so on. You see being picked up on the other side, uh, you know, GL transitions, this kind of thing, you know, comes sort of, well, Keynote did some of these things and then LibreOffice did some and then Microsoft. Is, so, so I think there's a sort of kind of a mixing bowl of, of you know, uh, ideas and, and, and ways people do things. And yeah, so I, I, I'm pretty excited. I, I think there's a lot to, uh, lot to do uh, here and lots of innovation possible. So. Uh, yeah, I, I think open source can uh, provide some some distinctive advantages here. Yeah, but the thing is, you're, you're we're still talking about creating documents. So what new thing we can do with? <laughs> oh yes, well that, yes, that's what... also you know. We're... <laughs> what new thing can we do with documents? Well, that is yeah. a good question, and and so I think there are all sorts of crazy things that we can do. I mean, one of the things Collabra is very interested in is virtual reality. I guess I, I was actually about to talk about that <laughs> because I think uh, your CEO is heavily... yeah, Philippe. Philippe yeah, is uh, yeah. the CEO, I guess, of our parent company, which is which is Collabra's, uh, you know, d doing lots of consultancy for all sorts of awesome stuff across the the scenes from you know in vehicle, uh, you know. Car systems through no know, don't put don't put document uh, creation in the Teslas because people will not be driving their car they'll what, just be well, working on the spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah. There's a little paint application I was just watching Jeremy Clarkson use whilst automatic driving. But you know, yeah, when you can take your hands off the wheel, why not? Yeah. But, so uh, yeah, yeah talking about VR. Yeah, you're talking about uh, VR. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you know, the thing is that um, I, I I don't know what's going to happen in the future. You know, there's there's so many uh, interface choices coming down. Aren't there? One of the things I'm excited about is Mozilla's Deep Speech. You know, providing audio input. And speech recognition for for this kind of application, 
Uh, and that that's really awesome because I think as a strategic open source project, you know, we, we are so suckered into send your voice to the cloud, have a device in your house always listening and, and pushing speech out that I think, you know, I'm really thrilled actually that Mozilla's putting money into that and making it, and encourage people to go and provide their voice. So one of the problems with AI is donating, finding the data sets. These are really expensive. And so often you end up with like a free software implementation that's trivial, you know, it's TensorFlow plus some tweaks. And then there's a big blob of weights that go into this magic brain and it does cool stuff. But how do you get those weights? And so, you know, tr trying to uh, build open data sets that help people train and learn is really cool. So I, I mean, I've, I've donated my voice, go, go and listen to, you know, the, the speech and they say, you know, please read this thing into the microphone. And hey, if you're you know, listening to this, you could probably do it now and help them build, you know, better models for uh, weird accents like this Cambridge English that uh, you know, comes out of me. Um, so, so I think that, that's, that's a really uh, interesting direction to go in. And I'm really hopeful that we won't have an Amazon Echo and a Google thing and a something else all listening to us at once and a Cortana and a, you know, but we can actually have something we can control and lock down and understand and know what's happening with our data. Uh, so, so I think that, that's one area that I'm excited about. Of course, VR is, you know, I don't know. There are so many directions the computer industry goes in all at once, which will succeed. We have a limited investment capability, uh, but it's, the community's investment is, is unlimited in, th in theory. So if, if you're interested and you want to work on this for you know, making LibreOffice better in any of these areas, grab me, uh, talk to me. We'd love to help you get working on, on something cool. Right. Uh, from, from a user's perspective, as a, I also write science fiction, and uh, my my own when I look at uh, any uh, productivity suite, whether it's LibreOffice or Pages, because I use all platforms just to keep myself updated. I don't want to live in a cave. Very sensible. Anymore. Yeah. Very sensible. So, uh, so so one thing that I uh, I like about Google Docs or macOS platform is that I can very use easily use references or context. Like for example, whether I'm looking at a word, not only just the meaning of the word, you know, but I I can you know it also opens a snippet from the Wikipedia where I can see what it yeah, means. Yeah. So I think yeah, those yeah. kind of things, you know, can, you know, uh, it, it, then I won't have to leave LibreOffice and go and do research and come back, you know, because it distracts <laughs> me. So these kind of features, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking that Definitely. A, lot of, a lot of scope is there, but I think all it needs is the engagement with the actual users community and people Definitely. comment. Yeah. And I think those things are key for keeping you in the flow. So when you're editing a document, yes. probably the worst thing you can do is go and look in a web browser because immediately you'll be reading the news, the Twitter, the something, oh, you know, right? Yeah. Uh, and you're doomed. Happens. <laughs> I just get I just get one notification and after half an hour I realize that why I'm on my phone I was supposed I've to be I still not done anything you know yeah yes. yeah I don't know I didn't yeah. know this is a new experience my father always used to say oh 12 o'clock and nothing done you know back in the day but but he was of course absorbed in some maths textbook you know looking at some <laughs> you know I don't know but, yeah, yeah, I, I, back in those days, when you buy a book, you're actually investing in what you are actually, these days it's so much distraction that I in know. the end, you just end up watching some YouTube video and read some political story, which never enriches you. It's just, so yeah. So those kind of features really cool in, you know, and of course I would love to have a VR where I can, I mean, because I don't want to use this 15 inch or 32 inch screen, you know, when I can just open a dock here in virtual reality, work on it using the virtual keyboard, close the dock and go back to what I'm doing. It will be awesome. That's my like kind of, yeah, I mean, I, I, whenever I think about it, I think, oh, that would be the feature I would really want just to wear some, <laughs> well, not Google glasses, but something better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Saves buying lots of high-res screens if you can take one with you, you know? And I think yeah. in terms of the Internet of Things, it's quite interesting too in terms of providing, yeah, uh, you know, monitoring and sensor information. In it. You know, you can't put a screen on everything. Uh, it's yeah. just too expensive. But you can put a little Bluetooth chip in it that can talk to your glasses. In theory. So yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of innovation possible there. I like to focus on something and get it to work well. And my right. customers are not currently asking me for <laughs> <laughs> a virtual reality. Yes, I know. I know. And I, I know the innovators dilemma. And I know that if I don't do all sorts of awesome things, then um, yeah. but, uh, but my hope is that other people in, in the free software ecosystem will, will prototype and play with all of these things. As, as, yeah, as Linus Torvald says, you know, when, while everybody is looking at the stars, I have to look at the potholes, you know, uh, and fix the <laughs> potholes that yes. you, otherwise you will be just, you know, you cannot keep looking at the stars. Somebody has to fix the road also. So that's the kind of work you are doing, you know, keeping making sure that you have a productive suit that is working fine without any... Definitely, but, definitely. And I mean, yeah. for all of the talk of tablets and mobiles and all these things, I still think people need keyboards to create content. <sighs> And okay, this is something interesting because initially when uh, when I talked to Italo and I was like, oh, we need an, uh, you know, a version for Android. But honestly speaking, even if I have an iPad Pro, I mm -hmm. don't use it to create documents. 
Exactly. I always want to go to my laptop or or my. Uh, it's it's yeah. okay if I'm in a plane and I just want to read a document. But if sure. I really uh, and and work, reading a document means you have to work on it, you know. So I always prefer either go to my desktop or a laptop. So, uh, it it is. Uh, it, it, I think yeah. I don't think there's there should be too much focus on that. But desktop version should be totally. Just I, I think online version is even more important than uh, than uh, mobile version. Yeah, yeah. So I think the online version for a PC user with a keyboard to create content and collaboration. I mean, the collaboration is, is brilliant. I use Collabor online times a day. Uh, you know, we do product management ranking in it, you know, in spreadsheets and financy uh, stuff. And we, we often minuting calls together and, and this sort of thing. It's nice to yes. share your minutes as you write them so people can check they're not too uh, too slanted. Right. And uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's a great tool for that. And that's where the that's actual well. competition in the market itself is with the Google Docs or Office 365, where people can sure. have their own control without having, because cloud offers a lot of flexibility, you know, but it also compromises on your ownership of the data. So with Colabra, you get both, you know, best of both worlds. Yeah. Any so, other, any so other, ownership, any other control, rap, features, yes, yeah, works. Yeah, exactly. Any, <laughs> other, any other words to wrap it up? Well, what else? Um, yeah, try it out. Uh, grab code. It's it's free. You can get it online. It's really awesome. Get involved. Uh, have a play with LibreOffice. Get involved in the community. There's so many things people can do. I mean, just running the latest test builds is useful. Uh, getting involved with filing bugs, uh, deduplicating other people's bugs, getting better prioritization for the developers, all sorts of stuff. And of course, the simple code tasks too, easy hacks on LibreOffice are a great way to get involved. And then, you know, there's some real heavy lifting that can be done too if you want to, you know, really get involved, uh, you know, uh, with the project. So yeah, it's, it's it's great fun and some good people involved. So uh, yeah, get stuck in. Yeah, Join I us. do know a lot of great people who are involved in it. So you don't have to tell. <laughs> 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 because I've been monitoring LibreOffice from the day zero before it was announced. So it's cool. fun. I still what? have uh, on the LibreOffice doc uh, wiki page, you know, that Swapna Bharatiya was, you know, one of the first, you know, journalists to interview the team. So yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, your support is much appreciated, Swapna. Yeah. Thank you for uh, you know. Yeah your hard work yeah thanks and keep you know working on this and i know i'll be looking forward to the next version of it you know cool. with all those cool features and once again thanks for your time and you know we'll look forward to meeting you again yeah absolute bye. pleasure well thanks Robin. bye, 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 bye. Thanks for watching. I think that was a great interview. As usual, it's always fun to talk to Michael. And I want to say thanks to all of you who have subscribed to this channel, who have uh, joined me on Patreon. If you don't know, a few days ago, I started a Patreon channel. And uh, it's, it's, it's not a very big channel. It's very tiny because I have not promoted it at all. I have a lot of contacts, but I have never talked to any of my friends about my Patreon. Um, because I'm still putting content there and at the same time I have some you know kind of personal issues like we had flu and everything so I'm just kind of recovering from that uh, but a lot of big open source events are coming up and that's where I'll be promoting this uh, Patreon and uh, the new site that I'm working on TFIR I, I'm sure you have heard of it um, that's I'll be promoting these pro products you know at those events heavily so you'll see a lot of you know support there but whoever is already on Patreon supporting me there, thank you so much. Everybody who has subscribed to this channel, thank you so much. And if you like my work, if you're already not on Patreon, please consider becoming a patron and support me there so that I can continue to create these uh, videos. You know, it's an expensive project and this is my full-time job. Uh, the more support I get uh, for this channel and for the site, uh, the more work I'll put there because, you know, it pays my bills. So whatever pays, I will write for other magazine. Once again, all I write is open source. So whether I write somewhere else or write here, it's the same thing. The only difference is here I have a lot more freedom to talk about things that I want to talk about, like talking to Michael, which may not be possible within a lot of you know enterprise magazines. So this gives me all the freedom to talk about open source and free software technologies across the board, not just enterprise. Actually. Libre, uh, Colabra as enterprise great technology. So anyway, the point is that it gives me the freedom to talk about everything that I want to talk about and the thing that I want you want to hear about. So please uh, consider supporting me there. And once again, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Uh, bye for now.